There is no serious person out there who would suggest somehow that you could even rig America's elections. In 2016, Russia was losing relevance among democracy-obsessed Americans. So when the United States was gearing up for the next presidential election, it was time to do something disruptive. But how could we break through in America's crowded media landscape? Our answer? Project Metal. We started by aligning ourselves with the top-tier influencer as the face of our campaign. Wouldn't it be nice if we actually got along with Russia? Putin was very nice to me. He said, Donald Trump is a genius. But right, I'll take that, right? Then built a social newsroom to amplify his content around the clock. Our team took a first-of-its-kind approach to earn media. Instead of relying on slow-moving traditional news organizations, we simply created our own news coverage. Here it is, close up. The devastating photo right there that proves Hillary Clinton's crippling health condition. Using Facebook's integrated data tools, we were able to create news that was highly relevant to our target in real time. As our community grew, we amplified our reach with tier two influencers, then deepened audience relationships with experiential stunts an innovative email strategy. And another release of hacked emails. And even integrations into emerging gaming platforms. What we've learned is that the Russians even tried to use Pokemon Go to effectively galvanize African-American outrage over police brutality. When the election day came, the results were undeniable. I've just received a call from Secretary Clinton. The campaign was number one trending topic on every news and social platform for months. In the end, we didn't just impact an election. We impacted an entire nation faith in democracy. America is crying tonight. I'm not sure how much of America, but a very, very significant portion. And I mean literally crying. Making Russia top of mind once again. Russia. 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 And drew attention away from our support of North Korea during the nuclear expansion. Okay. So, um, I think we should uh, introduce ourselves and then start there's a lot of things to discuss in there. I'm Andrew Morantz um, from The New Yorker. I'm moderating. Do you guys want to just? My name is Damaso Reyes. I'm the Director of Partnerships for the News Literacy Project. And my name is Gemma Craven. I'm the Head of Social and Mobile at McCann, New York. Um, and I was a member of um, the One Club jury um, judging social entries. And the Project Medal was one of the entries that we judged this year. And we have a symbolic empty seat. Uh, does anybody want to exp explain who the MTC seat is for? I believe we can introduce ourselves over here on this end, if you can hear us. Yeah, yeah, we can We can hear you. So so you're the inhabitor of the MTC. seat. Do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, we are uh, Project Metal, coming to you live from uh, our secret headquarters, which is actually a broom closet with a laptop. <laughs> okay, well, welcome from the broom closet. Uh, so we're all here together to um, to explain, well, to talk about the work and to sort of talk about why we're why we're talking about the work. So, um, since, since Gemma, since you were on the uh, jury, do you want to sort of, you know, think about like what it means to be considering this this work in this space? Like, what would you say about that? Yeah, I mean, I'll um, just to give some behind-the-scenes flavor of actually being on a jury um, and the number of entries that you review both in both stages of, of the adjudication. Um, and having spent several days with my fellow judges in a room looking at you know, various case studies and pieces of work, um, we, we saw the Project Medal case study. And you know, quite frankly, it's one of the best case studies I think I've ever seen. Um, because it, you can't deny the impact of you know, what happened. And 
it was also created in such a way that it used the, the formula of entering an award show, which is you know what we do, and it's an, um, an important formula to follow. But to tell a story in this way was incredibly impactful for you know us in the room, and also for thinking about um, what responsibility we have having seen this pre presented in a way, such a way um, as an industry. And I think that's what is really great, is that now we're actually doing what we should be doing, which is talking about what happened and what needs to happen moving forward. Um, and I think the Project Metal team just managed to really pinpoint a moment when they could make a really big impact. Mm -hmm. um, I'm seriously oh, hey. I'm great, Austin. Sorry. I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you, wanna, do you wanna introduce yourself as well? Or do you have a mic? Yeah. I do, I'm gonna sit on it. <laughs> I'm, I'm, hello, is it on? Yeah, I'm Susan Cradle. I'm the global CCO at FCB. So I said I would be on this panel and then I forgot that I'm here now. <laughs> well, welcome. Sorry. Hey, yeah, yeah, no problem. So, um, so, I mean, I guess in terms of, you know, we're talking about the case study being impactful and the, the project that it is, you know, the project metal itself being impactful. I guess the first thing for sort of everyone to, to jump in on is, what makes this an advertising case study? I mean, in, in, in a way it is, in a way it isn't, right? So what, what you know, why, you know, this is talking about politics, it's talking about, you know, Russia's impact on the election. Why are, why are we talking about it on this stage? Well, this was I entered, mean, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I'm sorry, go ahead, I can't see. <laughs> <laughs> um, I will, uh, so this was entered in the best use of social media category. I think that's important. Mm -hmm. And um, when you pull apart everything that that happened um, in terms of how Russia used platforms, worked with influencers, all of the things that we look at when we're judging work, it, it again, it was one of the best sort of put together strategies um, that, that we've seen. So I think that's an important sort of nuance to note. But I'd love to hear the Project Metal team's sort of take on that. The idea formulated for the case study when, when it was coming out exactly what tools and techniques Russia had used, and it was the exact same stuff we were all doing at our agencies during the day. We saw that Aziz Ansari, you know, he was photoshopped holding a sign saying, uh, save time, vote from home, vote with a tweet. And it was just a really clever and evil use of Twitter deception. It was just a social media campaign. And we were in the midst of making our own case studies for our own work that we do during the day. And uh, it, it all just sort of came together quickly because we realized it was the exact same thing. And, and yeah, so let's, let's break that down a bit. I mean, when we say the tools that were exactly the same or that, you know, when you say, um, you know, the, the, the influencers, the strategy, all the things you recognize, um, what, what, are, what are sort of points of resonance that either watching the case study or, or making the case study were kind of, you know, changed the way you thought about, you know, what, you know, what advertising is? Or, I mean, were the, was there anything that was particularly challenging in that regard or? I mean, the, the one thing I will always um, harp on when looking at case studies are results. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, you can see some results that what will, I'll say are a bit puffy. Mm -hmm. um, there's lots of the world's first, the internet's first, Facebook's first, yet the results of the case study that the Project Metal team put together are undeniable. And when you look at the fact that you know, coverage is still happening, it's Russia still being discussed, um, the kind of the, the lasting impact from Trump being elected onwards is, you can't really argue with that in terms of results mm -hmm. and um, effectiveness. Mm -hmm. So that that's one big thing. It's like, wow, okay, that yeah, this is fairly major. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And and we can talk. I mean, we, we we're going to talk about news news literacy as well because, you know, it goes in so many directions, right? The the there is the immediate question of the impact of one election, and then there's the larger question of how do we know what is real? You know, how do we know that you know we're actually talking to a person in a broom closet and it's not you know. A, a, a Russian bot that we're talking to. So, so um, where do you it's see? Have to trust us. <laughs> yeah, you seem very trustworthy. Um, where, <laughs> where, um, 
How, how far do the ripple effects of this sort of thing go? I mean, do you want to speak to the, the, the ripples of it? Well, I, I think we're still learning how far those ripples go. I think that societally, whether you work for an advertising agency or a technology company, we spent the last 20 years building things that when I was a kid or many people in the room were, were children, we wouldn't have imagined, right? Now we're learning the impact of those tools and how those tools can be misused, not just used, but misused. So I think one of the things that, um, you know, from the perspective of an organization that works in education, I, I think that the people in this room need to talk about amongst themselves and need to talk about with their clients is how you're using those tools, right? When you as an agency pay an influencer to post on Instagram and that influencer doesn't make clear that this is sponsored content, you are eroding the trust ecosystem because a 13 or 12 year old isn't necessarily sophisticated enough to realize that, wow, when that person says this is the best face mask ever, maybe they're being paid to do that. Now that's exactly what our organization is trying to help teach those young people. But um, I think when it comes to native advertising, when it comes to branded content, there's been a, a sort of a rush to use these tools without really talking about the impact that those tools have on the media, landscape on the trust landscape and I think that now obviously we're having a very big discussion about uh, trust news media and, and it's an important conversation to have yeah and and I actually wonder if it's not a uniquely challenging case um, specifically the media um, case uh, because it's so hard for a government ever to step in without violating the First Amendment, right? Or with, I mean, so it's it's almost unique in the sense of, you know, most industries can be regulated. In some sense, most well, of this is unregulated. Well, I mean, so if you guys want, you know, something to keep you up at night, if you, is if you didn't have enough, there have been uh, maybe a dozen countries around the world have either proposed legislation or, and I think in the case of Malaysia, actually enacted legislation to restrict fake news. Now, obviously, you know, I'm an American. I love the First Amendment. I'm also a journalist. So that's not going to happen here in the United States necessarily or not very easily. But around the world, the impact that, um, you know, this meddling in, in the U.S. election and in the, in the British election attempted in France and Germany is having is that countries that don't have a robust protection for free speech are now saying, oh, great, we can just ban uh, fake news. And, oh, who gets to define what fake news is? The government. Yeah. You know, and, th yeah. and that's pretty frightening. Well, you know, it's interesting. I always think about, like, when you go into magazine stands and over the years we've learned to go in and go, okay, if I buy that, that's trash. I want to read some trash, but I'm going to not read it knowing that it's been vetted and true. True. Then I get by a different brand, and I'm like, I'm pretty sure this is good reporting vetted. And I don't think we've figured out on the Internet how to distinguish. It's very, I mean, it's it's organic when you walk into a newsstand of, of you know, what you know is just ridiculous and what what's slanted conservative, what's slanted, you know, more liberal. Um, and I just don't think the way we're fed bits and pieces throughout um, the internet that we're we're naturally doing that. I think maybe self-regulation is the answer, you know, sh and building of brands. I mean, I think brands are going to become important on the internet when it comes to news because I'm, I'm going to start reading where am I getting this information from. And passing over the stuff that I don't recognize. But I think that's going to be an important thing in self-education of how to read the internet. Yeah, I mean, I would agree. I, th I think there's there's different layers, aren't there? There's the kind of consumers educating them or being educated um, so that they can under and distinguish between what's what's fake and what's not fake and what fake really means. And then, you know, there's the technology companies and platforms. And then to your point, I think brands are as an important steward of the people they're trying to reach his attention as the platforms are too. And, you know, you, we just saw this week, it was Google I.O., their big developer conference in uh, on the West Coast, and they just launched Google News, which is their kind of aggregated news, their new news offering. Um, and in that, they have adjudication to weed out fake news. And I think, you know, it's AI powered. And then that's another whole conversation around how does an AI know what the nuances of language are? How do, and so there's, it's certainly, it's going to continue to evolve. But I, I think there is no one regulator, and there can't be. There, we, we're all responsible, and we need to sort of take action, which again, kind of going back to Project Metal and how it raised that 
um, awareness of like we are, we're all stewards of this. We can't just sit passively and be like, oh, that looks good. Let's right. scroll here, you know. Yeah. And I think there's a little bit of an unfair attention on those platforms right now because Facebook's also implementing some great ideas about bundling fact-checked answers to articles that have been flagged as fake. But the truth is, is that all of these tools, the psychographic targeting that we're all suddenly becoming aware of, those were developed for us and by us and in collaboration with us. Um, we. Those weren't necessarily developed for the end user always. They were developed for the advertisers that are the way that these platforms exist, Google, Facebook, and the rest of them. And it just, it feels a little unfair for us as an industry to take credit for all the good we're doing, but not be a part of the conversation when those negative outcomes are coming to light. And you're seeing how this, the stuff that we made and co-created can be misused. Right. And and, and that, that gets us to the next place, which is we talk about self-regulation and self-education. And we do tend to speak about it, you know, the, how the consumer can educate themselves and how the brands can regulate themselves. What and and what you know? What about advertisers? How can they think about self-education, self-regulation? How can how can people in the advertising industry think about how to make the incentives align toward the good rather than sort of passively hoping that will happen? Well, from from our perspective, I I think that we're very focused on education. I think the idea that your average consumer of information, whether they're 15 years old or 50 years old, is somehow going to learn how to navigate this on their own, I, I don't think that's gonna happen. I think we have to use the vectors like the school system that we have in order to, to educate people and give people the tools they need. I also think that agencies need to have conversations with their clients and tell them when they wanna do something that's disruptive, that that disruption is not necessarily a good thing for the ecosystem. And it, in some cases, you have to walk your clients back and let them know that, yes, in the short term, you may get a win here, but you're damaging. It's like clear cutting the forest. And as a long term strategy, if we create a situation where people don't know what to trust, then people will not trust anything. And so then how will your brand be able to communicate? It won't. And that's, you know, should be scary for anybody here who works in the room in an advertising department or at an agency. And I, I would just encourage, we're going to have questions in a little bit, and I would encourage everyone to think about how possible that conversation currently seems and how to create an environment where that conversation seems more possible, right? If you think about going to a client and saying, hey, this is a way that we can really achieve all your goals. It just, we think it's icky and we think you shouldn't do it. Imagine having that conversation and, and whether you think that seems possible right now. Like what? So, so I, I mean, I guess I'll, leave, I'll turn that into a question for you guys. Where do you think the opportunities are now in the world as it exists to, um, to, not, to not clear cut the forest, to not say, look, I have a really great way for you to chop down this tree that's in front of you and to see the forest for the trees? I'm not in advertising, but for, from my perspective, I think that you have to get clients to to not just value the quick hits, not value the cheapest way to uh, get their message out there or even the most disruptive way, but to get them to understand that they are part of a larger community, which I think most brands realize, but that also that they have a responsibility to be transparent. And I think that we're hearing that a lot, especially within the, the news media and news organizations. How can we be more transparent? And I think that with what I'm seeing in advertising as a consumer of information is more opaqueness. Oh, I didn't know that this brand created this piece of content. And oftentimes, brands are paying a premium for that opacity. So it's interesting, though, but I, I, th I think that's what you're seeing. But I think how it's getting there is very different than what you're thinking, which is, Clients have been told, and actually agencies have been told, that advertising is dead, nobody wants to see ads, and it's all about branded content. Told by whom? Um, each other, mainly, I think. I mean, I, 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 I love advertising. I like being very transparent. You're now seeing an ad, and it better be creative, and we hope that the ad... I mean, I grew up with traditional media, and from a junior copywriter, I was told, I want your work to be more interesting, your advertising to be more interesting than the editorial content it sits amongst. So I've never thought that advertising at one point could be dull or bad or whatever. And so this branded content thing, I think, has been a huge distraction. And what it does is it makes advertisers content creators. 
for the publications and the platforms. And by the way, I think we're looking at the likes and shares of branded content in the wrong way because it, I'm not in the business of creating content. I'm in the business of building brands and selling products, you know, and and so if you just like my content but you don't know who it was brought to you by and you're not interested in the product, I don't give it doesn't really matter to me. It's a it, that's a loss on my side. And I'm lo I love that that being outside of what we're in every day that you actually think it's about being opaque. I think we have been told if and I, I don't buy it, but we the the if you read every trade magazine in the last five years, it's like you have to stop looking like an ad or people can't see you as being advertising. You have to look like something else that they're interested in. And I think it, it's a great thing that you brought up is that that actually could really hurt the brands because it is opaque and it doesn't feel authentic and it, it doesn't feel transparent that you're trying. And there's nothing wrong with selling stuff. There's absolutely nothing wrong with helping light the economy. And I was down in um, New Orleans at the Collision Conference and the CEO of ad blockers came on and he was like, we need advertising. We need advertising to fund brilliant reporting. I mean, it's expensive. Reporting is very expensive. Advertising can help. We should be proud of that, not hide behind it. And I think to, to build on that um, and to talk about you know the opportunities there now, um, it's about working with brands to help them understand their role in the ecosystems they're within. And, you know, we talk a lot about meaningful role and Purpose-led marketing is, you know, become very much buzz, more buzzwords um, du jour. But I think if you sort of go to the heart of what that means, it's about understanding what a brand is, what they stand for, the actions they will take because of those core values and the role that they play in a consumer's life, and then working in that world and not trying to kind of step out of it to become all things to all people, or you know, to your point, creating content that is confusing. So, you know. It, this will mean coming off of some of the digital platforms and doing more kind of acts out in the real world so that people out there can experience brands in different ways. But I think our responsibility is to help our you know, brand partners to figure that out. Mm -hmm. um, and and I'll, I, I think it's possible that the broom closet had something to say on that, but I'll just uh, push one, <laughs> one uh, link forward in this, which is, you know, we talk about how the incentives can be aligned, you know, transparency can be better for the advertiser, can be better for the brand, and better for the consumer. I'm curious if there's ever been a case, a real case or a hypothetical case, where you can imagine um, giving something up in exchange for the other thing. So I mean, I was on a, you know, speaking of cutting the platform some slack, I was on a call with uh, reporters asking Mark Zuckerberg questions, and one of the toughest questions he got asked was, when have you given up profit for Facebook in order to do the right thing? And I think that's a question that everybody can be asking. When, when uh, or how can you leave stuff on the table in order to say, you know, we could do this, but it's just not the right thing to do? Well, I actually think the marketers that refused or pulled their money out of digital because they said they didn't know what content they were sitting amongst. That, I mean, that's, I don't think they pulled out because they didn't think digital was working. I think they pulled out because they thought it was out of control. And that's a perfect example of, of someone saying it's an important space for us, to, for us to be in, but we can't be in it until you figure it out. It's one. Mm -hmm. And th this is people who just got off of digital altogether, or? Yeah, I, 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 I yeah. yeah. Is that the broom well, closet? So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hello. Sorry. No, no, go for it. <laughs> I, I think it's that weird you know, there's obviously laugh. good work to be done with the right client. Uh, uh -huh. But I think us as an industry can do a lot without necessarily it stemming from a client brief because we are the experts in this space. And I believe that the people in this room can envision future solutions to the problems we're all talking about and then potentially find the clients or, or, find, or do pro bono work or do proactive initiatives to be a force for good without waiting for the right client to come along. Yeah. You know, I, I know Fearless Girl is something that you're familiar with and I know that that was an idea that was, you know, that was born from an agency and brought to the right client. So I just wonder, you know, if, and, and just to get it all out on the table, the reason why we're doing this now and why we put together the money to invest in these awards entry fees is because we think something needs to happen before the midterms. And, and we think that if we're waiting for the right client education process, which is also extremely important, to come along for us to make a positive impact, it might be too late or more damage is going to be done. So I guess our, our question as Project Metal is what can we do now? And do you want to, I mean, do you want to expand on, on 
sort of your thoughts about what can be done now? I mean, do you have... Um, sure. Yeah. So, I mean, if we had the solution to this, we would have done that instead of this. <laughs> um, you know, and the reason why we're anonymous and hiding in a broom closet is it's not about the agencies that we're at. It's about us as an entire industry coming together and having this conversation. Mm -hmm. And so we've actually uploaded a, a brief to our website, projectmetal.org, that's an open brief that any agency can take and run with. And that's a long preamble to say, I think that there's different solutions from different parts of this industry. A media company would have their own ability to chip away at maybe deceptive media buys. Um, a creative shop could have a really brilliant idea to surface truth in a divisive swing state. I think that, you know, again, our expertise in this gives us all kinds of potential. And I think it's going to take many different proactive efforts, not just a single one, to, to fix this media environment. That we're in. And also be able to be mindful about uh, our proposed ideas. Oh, wow. That's, yeah. I think the, the FSB got to the broom closet. Um, do we, um, so, so yeah, so that, that puts a lot of stuff uh, on the table to think about. I mean, I think that it's a good point that the, everybody has a role to play and that nobody is kind of outside of it. I mean, again, you know, talking about the platforms, what you'll often read in the press is, well, you, normal person, don't necessarily have the power to shape it because you're not the client, you're the product. Well, the, you know, this room is the client, right? So, uh, so how, can, um, how can the people in this room affect change? There's, there's you know, the, the platforms are made for them in a lot of ways. So I guess, you know, we were talking about getting off of digital, getting off of social, staying, you know, staying within the realm of social media as it sort of ascends and has more and more power. Can we think of anything that we can do with that influence to make social not a dumpster fire, right? Like how can we, um, <laughs> how can we get it to a place where there is a little trust, there is a little bit of truth? Oh, I, I think there's a lot that advertisers and agencies can do. I think first conduct an audit of what your work is and what the work you're doing on behalf of your clients are. Is there anything that makes you feel a little bit queasy? Uh, whether it's in the past or something you're doing right now. I think that that's sort of do a gut check and say, okay, maybe we should stop you know, buying ads in those chum boxes at, on the bottom of questionable websites. That's you know, a great way to dry up the misinformation uh, also, ecosystem. Also on the bottom of not that questionable websites too. Well, which is, yeah. well that, that, yeah. that as well. Yeah. Right, so there's there's a specific thing. Yeah, you have some. And I think to um, so the proactive point of taking a proactive stance on transparency as, as an agency and a, as a brand and talking and defining who an audience would be that you would be targeting and what you would be sharing and actually kind of revealing some of this information that we all know and that happens behind the scenes when we build an audience and we're looking at you know a demographic that we want to reach. Let's tell them what we're doing. I mean, I have seen um, as well, I think this is great, some influencers starting to share um, posts where they're showing what they're actually doing. So one, um, the girl I love called Rachel Martino will show a shot of her standing looking fab, you know, in front of the Flatiron building. And then the next shot will show exactly how long she had to, she'll talk about how long she had to stand there to get that perfect image and the fact that she had makeup and a stylist and um, a photographer there helping her. So it's actually peeling back some of that veneer of like, oh, I want that perfect life, which is kind of one of the, you know, things that we really do need to overcome is that, like, oh, wow, that, that, that person lives such a perfect life. And you read these stories about, you know, influencers going massively into debt because they're traveling the world trying to, in search of the perfect image. So I think having that proactive stance on, actually, this is what we're doing, this is what we had to do to get here, um, it might take some of the magic away in, in certain places, but that's what we need to do because it's, um, that's what's leading to times when, you know, the kind of the bad actors are using the techniques that we've all used um, f for years now. Mm -hmm. We love that. We were also recently reading about an agency that had figured out the keywords that uh, extremist groups were buying, and they started outbidding those same keywords to divert people to a website that helped them get help and learn about extremism and the tactics they use. It was fully an education initiative along those same lines. But because they knew exactly the techniques that the extremist groups were using, they were able to beat them at their own game. We were blown away by that. 
Yeah, and I think that's a good point. You know, sometimes people get a little queasy talking about things like Project Metal because they don't want to think about meddling. They don't. They 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 would rather live in a world where there isn't any kind of arms race going on. But in fact, there is. And you know, one way to, one way to do it is to get better at at your side of the arms race. Um, we're going to open it up for for questions in a minute. Um, so and I and I do want you know people to bring in specific things that you know. We, we all, there, this is a national conversation, and everybody who is, is, you know, American or even not American has thoughts on the general conversation. But if you guys have specific things as, as members of the industry that, you know, questions that this brings up or, or things you've experienced that come to bear on it, um, I'd be particularly interested I just, in that. I have one question for the group, if you yeah. don't mind, before it goes to the audience. I, we just were so curious about what the reaction was for the jury. Gemma, you talked about that that it was something that stood out, you know, as you were judging. What was that like? What, what happened in the room? It, I will say it was just everybody um, fell silent because, um, like I said before, the case study was so well put together, but also thought-provoking because, you know, we, we'd seen a lot of content by the time we came to the, the Project Metal case study. So, um, you know, just naturally where it fell in the programming, which I don't is not anything I don't think you would know to to secure, but just actually the way it was created. Um, it, it, again, we it led to a big discussion between the judges about what our role was and our responsibility and, and how to move forward with the, the actions that needed to come out of actually seeing the case study. So um, you definitely cut through at, at the right moment. So, I, you know, isn't that the point of... Of, of what you did, so I think that that's great. Great. Thank you. Uh, yes. Yeah, so it was, you know, again, in terms of the scoring um, of how things work, that's obviously the, um, you know, we're there as judges to score within a system, and I know there's certain um, entry requirements, and certainly we'd scored. Um, we'd scored the entry, and then sort of talked to the um, the one show. Um, team as to you know what this would be able to receive versus versus not in an award, and I think there's entry requirements about this being aligned to a brand. Yeah, so I just wanted to be clear that the jury thought this was best in show, and then it was brought to the one show's attention, the one club's attention, that there really was no client. I mean, the client's Russian, but it's a meta idea, and to be fair to the rules i mean you know we we try to honor the rules of of what we set we came to the conclusion that it's a it's a very beautiful piece of film i think it's a provocative piece of film but there was no client attached so we talked about what can we do and this is what we're doing right now is to honor it um, but it's also because there were when i looked at it i was like god if it just had at the end new york times you know truth um, I would have been like, you would have won everything, <laughs> you know, and then, I, and then we started saying, well, you know, it's interesting that this industry forces creative people that are out there trying to solve problems that they have passionate beliefs about to have to go find a client in order to put it out into the world. And one of the things that we've been discussing since this conversation is, should we have a place in the show for passion projects where you just look at, you, you know, the people in the broom closet and they don't have to say who they are. They can just it can just be a passion project, and we celebrate passion projects because you're right. This world needs us to use our talents to do things to counterbalance what's going on. And if we have all these rules and regulations, and I like what you all said, you entered the show to get PR. I mean, to to get to you know, it's almost a media buy. And so hopefully by doing this and. You've started a conversation, and we'll continue it. You know, through if we add a, another vertical um, at this at this show um, to to encourage and inspire creatives to do the kinds of things you did. Excellent. So, is is there anyone uh, wants to follow up on that? Uh, we just want to thank the one show for making time for this conversation. It, it was the the hope, so we appreciate that very much. Well, and your jury fought really hard for you too. <laughs> we did. <laughs> yeah, and it's 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 good to have a space to to talk about this stuff. Um, all right, anything anything else from the broom closet? Do you, um, 
I mean, we can rant for hours. <laughs> uh, obviously, we. I think the brief is it. You know, we thought long and hard about what to do with this moment where we we can't see the room, but we're imagining a stadium filled with brilliant creatives. And yeah. you know, our dream would be for you to download the brief. You know, we have some nonprofit partners that you could do something proactively for. Win that category that it sounds like they're going to create next year by being a force for good by using our brilliance to 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 be the you know the creative force in the world we want. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to make a pitch. I mean, you know, we're a small nonprofit. We're out there trying to help young people navigate the digital landscape. You guys could volunteer to work pro bono with us. There are lots of other great nonprofits working in the media space that just don't have the capacity to get their message out, right? We're reaching, you know, some small fraction of a percent right now of the U.S. student population. We hope to grow that. Have, but you, have you reached out to the Ad Council? We're talking to the Ad Council. Okay. We're working closely, actually, with the PR Council okay. right now. But, you know, you guys can come to us and to other nonprofits that are doing good work in lots of other spaces, like carving You're out. You're in our brief, by the way. <laughs> there we go. But, you know, but, it is but, interesting. You know, co co corporate social responsibility this, is a big thing, right? This also might be a case. It's great to be in the school systems, but it also might be um, an interesting way to, to, I remember when recycling was a bizarre concept, and, and I don't know, it, they, they started in schools, but with kids teaching their parents. And by the way, I can't tell you how many things I like forward to somebody, I'm like, interesting article, and they're like, it's 10 years old, you know, and I'm like, oh, sorry, that didn't happen right now. You know, I, it's not just the kids, it's me. I mean, I'm a terrible abuser of information, you know, I, I, I have to really work hard to remember that this stuff is out there and I need to be aware of what's going on. But it's interesting to say, if you start in the school system, don't think that the parents and the, and the grandparents don't need to also know. We're all being manipulated. It, it has a huge impact, but remember that, you know, if you want to something else to keep you up at night, uh, no. who here remembers where they were on uh, New Year's Eve 1999? Anybody? I, I remember, right? We're all old enough to have been, or most of us have been out and about. Well, kids who were conceived on New Year's Eve 1999 are going to be voting in the midterms elections. So we, we think about, oh, you know, we're going to invest in education. It's such a delayed impact. If you start talking to a high school freshman, they're going to be voting in, or a high school sophomore or junior, they're going to be voting in 2020. So, you know, millennials are now going to be the biggest cohort generation bigger than baby boomers, the generation after them. It's, you know, we're, we're, we're going to be out of the way soon enough, right? So we really do have to focus on young people and what they're learning because these, these are digital natives, right? It's the first generation to grow up embedded in the internet, embedded with social media, and now we actually should come up with some societal rules for them to follow so that they can actually make decisions based on real information, not on misinformation. Yeah, and in terms of rules and, and etiquette, I mean, I guess the pitch I would make uh, is to think not only about true and false and transparent and opaque, but also about the general tenor and tone of the conversation because the thing that, that we run into, you know, at, at The New Yorker, we, ev we always strive to be fact-checked and verified and true, but we don't always get people to click on our stuff because it doesn't have a really sexy hot take in the headline. So, and I think what everybody in the room can can think about regarding that is to not create such a polarized, blaring, my horn can be louder than your horn kind of conversation and to try to think about not making things boring and people eat their vegetables, but just in terms of like, what is the etiquette and what is the ethics around um, not trying to out-compete all the time, but maybe trying to create a, a more balanced ecosystem. Yeah? I'll repeat, I'll repeat. We have a microphone. Yeah, I can also repeat for the broom. Oh, no, there it is. Hi, for the broom closet and everybody else. Um, speaking as a Northeast liberal, um, I would never have seen half of what you just showed because it doesn't come up on my feed. And what this reminds me, going to speaking what Susan's talking about with 
um, traditional media and whatnot is uh, during the election cycle, I had a brief moment where I was in Massachusetts and this unbelievably bizarre ad came on and I turned to my mother-in-law and I go, what was that? And she said, oh, this station plays in New Hampshire too. And I was like, what the hell are these people seeing? And at that time, a lot of advertisers weren't spending money to run commercials. And I got came back to the city and I was like, oh my God, I know why they're not making commercials. I saw this horrible thing that was playing in New Hampshire. And ah, because Coke or you know, PG or whoever would never want their brand against that. So the thing is, it is a fair assessment to say we're in the Wild West with um, digital, and I do think that if advertising and Project Metal or whoever it is can shine the light and explain to people, like, this micro-targeting thing is majorly real. I only saw a little bit of it by seeing the New Hampshire ad as a New Yorker, where I was like, what is going on? But this is, like, new in a way that all of us need to be educated about. So I'd never even seen like the Hillary Satan. Like I would never see that. They would never show me that. Well, and so how am I going to see it unless advertising or somebody or is showing it to me? Ad council, whoever. Like we do need to either create a group that's addressing this as part of our business, or make it part of an ad council offshoot. I don't know, but there does there should be something so at least we know what's out there. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, and, and building on that, the, uh, some of the super micro-targeted stuff is, Facebook is just starting to address that, the dark ads that only one person can see, and that might be something internally to do a gut check about maybe boycotting dark ads altogether, you know? Um, one more in the back. Hi, uh, I had the opposite experience. I grew up in rural Texas, so I have consciously left my Facebook feed open so I can still see some of the crazy. Um, and my question actually goes to something Susan said early on, and you said you go to the newsstand and you look at traditional media and you filter. And I know so many adults who can't even comprehend the fact that a major publication would have a bias. And so my question is, how do we make personal responsibility a bit sexier? How do we make it worth digging for people who aren't in this room, who aren't privy to the ad council, who don't feel the urge to dig? Well, I, I think we have to teach it. I think we have to give people tools. I think one of the challenges right now is that your average consumer of social media feels helpless. They don't, un they don't understand, well, how, how can I verify whether or not something is true? How can I tell whether or not this was created by an agency or a political campaign? So I think that education, whether it's through social media or in the education system is going to play a huge role. If you guys want to see something cool, uh, Google Wall Street Journal Blue Feed Red Feed, right? So you can click on specific topics and look at a conservative and a liberal right. feed to see how differently uh, people who are looking at something like the issue of uh, immigration or North Korea, they'll see those two feeds. But a lot of it is we have to empower people, mm -hmm. right? And if we want to talk about personal responsibility, we have to give people the tools and, and the understanding that they can actually, you know, have an impact and they can figure out what's real and what's not. Yeah, and very much in, con in concert with that, I would just say you, could, you can also sell it, you know? If you guys, you can sell personal responsibility and try to advertise it as a sexy thing. I mean, if you guys can make milk sexy and peanuts, and you, I, I trust that you can do it. So, uh, I, well, I read it really. Just, just to reinforce the scale of the problem, too. You know, I think somebody brought up the term "it's the Wild West" now. There is a Bernie Sanders subreddit that recently just came back to life with a bunch of two-year-old accounts that have somewhat broken English. That is meant to be a divisive left subreddit, and. It seems to be a meddling operation that's already kicking off, and that is totally based on influencing a Reddit, anonymous Reddit community to then go out and infiltrate all other media. Mm. That's just one of the things that's been identified. So I think that it's gonna take all of us to create literacy about a media environment that's this sweeping and this complicated. That's great. Okay, on that scary note, I think we, we gotta get out of here. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.